Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Oxford Internet Institute's fifth webinar of the term, featuring the editors of the book, Your Computer is on Fire, Mar Hicks, Kavita Phillip, Ben Peters, and Tom Mullaney, all hosted today by Gina Neff of the OII. A little housekeeping, we are fortunate to have a varied audience with a wide range of views, and we request that the opinions of others are respected in this space. For your awareness, this event is being recorded and will be posted on our website following the event. You can pose any question using the Q&A tab at any time, and these will be answered towards the end of the talk. And please try to keep questions as concise as possible. The questions will be visible to all attendees and can be commented upon and upvoted, and we will endeavour to follow up on any unanswered queries. Please allow me to introduce Gina Neff. Welcome, and thank you everyone for joining us um, today on uh, what promises to be a really exciting event. I have with us today our um, uh, fabulous guests who are the editors of this great volume, which has just landed in the UK, Your Computer is on Fire from MIT Press. They are a group of historians and historians of media who are really raising a call to arms. They're looking at the ideas of inequality and discrimination, marginalization, that in their words, um, fuel how we think about technology as a way to fix or control society. That these ideas um, that technology, the problems with technology are um, buggy and can be patched is really a dangerous idea. And we have to think about larger social, technical, um, and, and, and cultural systems that intersect and are at play. So with very little further ado, um, I'd like to walk you through how we're going to run the evening today. So uh, we'll start with a short um, reading or excerpt from the book from each of the four editors, and then we'll bring them all on to have a shared conversation about the book, taking your questions and hopefully in a, in a dialogue and a conversation. So, so join me first in welcoming to the OII, um, Tom Mullaney. Tom. Um, Tom, your Kim there. We don't see you just yet, Tom. Oh, I need host to permit me. Um, that is my cue to let. Hello. Perfect. Is is uh my voice is okay? It's it's a pleasure to uh, to be here, and thanks for having me. Um, so uh, I wanted to start off this conversation by telling everyone a bit about the origin story of this volume. And, um, and then I will turn it over to my colleagues who will kind of carry the, the, the torch, um, pun intended, from there. But in, in lieu of actually a passage from my introduction, I want to tell you about where this, where this volume came from, uh, which I think speaks to why we felt it was so critical, why the editorial team and contributors felt it was so critical. So in essence, it's a story of probably one of the most disturbing emails that I ever received uh, in my career. And it was also one of the most revealing. This was 2015, I think it was, and I was in the thick of organizing the first of the conferences that led to this volume. It was called Shift Control, Computing and New Media in Global Perspectives. And it took place in spring of 2016. And it brought together leading scholars, early career scholars uh, from the US, the UK, Europe, and elsewhere, talking about computing in the Soviet Union, East Asia, Latin America, the Islamic world, and so forth. And, you know, uh, I've organized many conferences in my life thus far, but this one just caught fire immediately. Uh, the support for it exceeded every expectation. The funders just for this conference on global computing, um, uh, included history, science, technology, and society, okay, uh, but also global studies, Latin American studies, Islamic studies, East Asian studies, gender studies, the Abbasi Center for Islamic Studies, and the list went on and on. But there was one conspicuous absence from the list, and this was the computer science department at my home institution of Stanford, which of course carries some weight within the global computing science world, of course. I had reached out twice by that point, I uh, provided an overview of the confirmed speakers who were luminaries, uh, are luminaries, as well as a detailed rationale of the conference. 
Um, and I kind of noted a bit diplomatically at first that it might seem a little awkward if computer, computer science wasn't in the list of supporters, even for you know a dollar, even for uh, paying for the coffee for the event, something just uh, to get the name on the list, given the subject matter of it. Nothing, silence. And then finally, I decided to be a bit less diplomatic. I sent a third email um, and I just asked, you know, is computer science interested in this kind of dialogue with the humanities? And then I got a response. It was a rejection letter. Not a dollar will be spent on this conference uh, was basically the message of it, but it also contained uh, something of a, a miniature essay which uh, spoke volumes to me. And, um, and I will quote it without naming the author of it. The CS people I know are interested in new technological possibilities and new ways of applying technology to socially relevant concerns. To the degree, the quote continues, to the degree that humanistic values and issues provide ideas for design, they are interested. They are not particularly interested in cultural historical rumination. And then the author went on to say that the description of the conference that I had given, which again leads to this very volume, suggested, quote, a lot of ponderous talk of the kind that engineering oriented people see as the irrelevant part of the humanities. Uh, wow, did that shock and kind of enrage me to be, to be honest, but it also gave me a lot of fuel, I know, to carry on this project, which then grew to the editorial team and this amazing contributing team over the course of that, not only that conference, but then a second one, which was called Your Computer is on Fire, um, and led to, in, sp in particular, and this is where I'll close this opening part, a decision by our editorial team to demand of ourselves and to really demand of our contributors that they put aside all of the um, equivocating language, this sort of hemming and hedging language that academics are notorious for, to put that aside and to come out with their gloves on, uh, by which I mean, don't pull any punches. We're going to um, say what we mean in the most direct language possible, on a basis of rich empirical research and our own expertise, and we're not going to hedge our bets. And so for anyone in the audience who has a chance to look at the volume or has, you'll notice in the table of contents that every one of our essays is a declarative sentence. When uh, Nathan Ensmenger talks about the environmental history of computing and the cloud, he does not write, the cloud can be thought of as a factory. He writes, the cloud is a factory. Uh, and when Mar Hicks, uh, editor and contributor, writes that gender, uh, that, 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 that we have a bug, it is not can be thought of a bug, is that it is. Um, and we have asked everyone in the contributing pool and the editors to come out and declare. And in, in a sense, this is a dual critique. It's a critique of those who like the person and others, the person who wrote this email and others who might agree with them. It's a critique of this way of dismissing absolutely critical scholarship that's going on, not only in this volume, but you know, among hundreds and thousands of other scholars. And it's also a critique of ourselves that the time for equivocation is over. Um, it's the time for being polite is over. The world is on fire and we need to intervene. So that's the sort of quick summary of the origin of this volume. And now, of course, let me turn it over to my colleagues who can walk through a bit more concretely what's at stake in the volume. Thanks, Tom. Mar, I think uh, we hear from you next. Um, yeah. OK, well, um, yeah, thanks so much for that uh, introduction um, to why we did this volume. I will also add that one of the big reasons that I had for wanting to be involved in this volume was because I wanted something like this to be able to take back to the classroom and teach. Because fortunately, I think that the views, I hope, that that computer science professor um, angrily, you know, professed in that email to you 
Um, they seem to be losing ground. The people in power still oftentimes hold these, but um, I noticed that my students, at least I teach at a STEM focused institution, are really not of that mindset anymore. And so I really focused on writing, um, for instance, the introduction and my chapter in this volume for use in um, educating undergraduates or people who want a primer to what's uh, the history that got us to this moment of tech clash. So I'm going to just read a short section from my introduction to the book, which is called, When Did the Fire Start? We are witnessing a period in which it's becoming ever more urgent to recognize that technological progress without social accountability is not real progress. And that in fact, it is destructive to the democratic institutions and norms we have long held up as ideals. As Sarah T. Roberts shows in her chapter in this book, the fiction that platforms that are our main arbiters are, of information are also somehow neutral has effectively destroyed the public commons. As Sophia Noble has shown in Algorithms of Oppression, trusting an adver advertising corporation to be a neutral purveyor of information when their profits depend on manipulating that information fundamentally misunderstands our capitalist marketplace, as well as the value and nature of unbiased information. This insight extends to every platform that makes a profit through telling people what they are expected to want to hear or want to click on, rather than the often inconvenient, unprofitable, or disturbing truth. As scholar David Columbia points out, the US in the 21st century um, in the US in the 21st century, there's a widespread belief that governments should not have access to privacy invading technologies like facial recognition. Yet many ignore the fact that multi-billion dollar corporations are already deploying these technologies with no democratic oversight or citizen input. Because corporations are are not elected, they cannot be voted out, and yet they have become pseudo-governmental by virtue of their wealth, power, and the reach of their technological systems. Their leaders insist that they and they alone know what is best for us, from what information we should see to how much privacy we should retain. Increasingly, these companies have placed themselves in the role of determining how we move about in the world, literally and figuratively, and their power to define our reality increasingly extends to the power to decide elections in the United States and other nations, taking away our most fundamental rights as citizens to self-determination. These corporations tacitly assert that our future should be decided in the end by what is most profitable and efficient for them, rather than being left to the messy process of democracy unfiltered by the technocratic class. They tell us to trust them and repeatedly assure us that the tech industry will police themselves and fix their own mistakes. Unfortunately, as a historian, I can tell you that this never works. If the crisis that we're currently living through has not already made it apparent, we can see it clearly in recent technological history. And then the book goes on to give a lot of examples of that so that we can hopefully start to imagine a different present and different future from here. Thanks for that, Mar. Um, next, I think on doc is Kavita to help us think through more of the content of the book. Thanks, Gina and the OII. And as um, Tom said, um, what was unique about that first conference for me was the global. It's uh, very common to have national level conversations. I've certainly been part of those in different national contexts, uh, but this was a rare event to actually talk about what united and what divided the discussions across the world. For example, discussions of infrastructure um, had a historically separate kind of tone. In the West, in the, the kind of lush, money-rich decades after World War II, infrastructures tended to be backgrounded because they worked. 
uh, the years after World War II saw a lot of investment in infrastructure and people who were born then and grew up in the second part of the 20th century in the West just assumed that roads and bridges and water would work. And uh, in the non-West, where many of us grew up, those were the struggling development decades and most things did not work. That was what underdevelopment felt like. That went through a weird uh, inversion at the end of the 20th century. We started to have scandals around infrastructure in the West that often were tied to racial and social inequalities, water, in Detroit and Flint, Michigan, um, bridges that fell down. While uh, in the non-West, we had the so-called Asian tigers emerging, China's incredible highway projects, for example, India's incredible uh, cell phone penetration, as they call it, the penetration of the markets. So I was interested in both um, how global and US narratives intersected or didn't, as well as a rising tide of social justice all around the world that I think still needs to, to form vocabularies to talk to each other. So I'm gonna read from the end of my chapter, the internet will be decolonized. And in conclusion here, I draw from many of the other chapters. So like Mar, I'm going to talk about my, the intersections of my work with the other chapter contributors. Concerns about social justice and decolonization have begun to shape many of the new analyses, not just about the internet, which my chapter is about, but of all internet driven data and representations on and around the internet. The decolonial urge to democratize the production, the dissemination of knowledge and the ownership of knowledge on the internet is inextricable from material understandings of the internet. So what do I mean by material understandings? Older colonial era infrastructures predated and enabled 20th century cable laying projects. Geopolitics, as well as undersea rubble, repeatedly break cables or shift routing paths. Representational inequities cycle into policymaking about regulating access to knowledge. Once seen as a neutral technological affordance, the internet is increasingly being understood as a political domain, one in which technology can enhance certain kinds of political power and suppress others, radically shifting our notions of the democratic public sphere. Celebrating this new technology that set the world on fire in the late 20th century, this chapter seeks not simply to tar it with the brush of old politics, but to ask how this fire in all its social, political, and technological aspects can be tended in the interests of an increasingly diverse global community of users. As in Sarah Roberts chapter, Your AI is a Human, it turns out that the infrastructural internet and the creators of its imaginaries are connected by the labor of global humans. Like the Nathan Ensmenger, who says the cloud is a factory, and Benjamin Peters, who says a network is not a network, I turn to the history of the material infrastructural view of the internet, a view of the internet's origin story that was once articulated primarily by infrastructural engineers. But we found there's more than infrastructure at play here. As Halcyon Lawrence, who said Siri disciplines, and Tom Mullaney, who tells us typing is dead, suggest, non-white users are increasingly resisting the imperial norms that shape our internet related practices. National histories and imperial politics help select the stories we tell about the internet's past as well as shape what we do with its future. Seeing this requires skills in analyzing metaphor, narrative and social history. We find that the separation of technical and cultural skills has produced knowledge that impedes the integrated improvement of technical design and use. And I think here I was directly addressing that computer scientist who said, we just need to design better stuff. I actually think if we, we take out the cultural ponderings, we actually design worse things and we design for inequality. We need stories, and this is my conclusion, that showcase the irreducibly political realities that make up the global internet. The continual human labor, the mountains of matter displaced, 
its diverse material and representational habitats. Acknowledging that the political and the digital cannot be separated might serve as an antidote against the seductive ideal of technological design untouched by the messiness of the real world. Thank you, Thank you for that. Um, uh, next, we'll bring on Ben Peters, um, joining us from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And um, after Ben, we'll bring all the panelists back on and, and start the discussion. So be thinking about your questions. And remember, you can put questions in the Q&A slot at the bottom of the Zoom. Ben. Thank you, Gina. And thank you, co-editors and collaborators and comrades across across the, the world. Um, I wanted to just echo and continue to resonate the work that my co-authors uh, and co-editors have already outlined. Um, the, the work of this, of this volume in many ways attempts to concentrate language as a force for change and a force for, uh, for social good. Um, and so to that end, I'm just going to, as briefly as possible sample spaces where there's kind of concentrated language and get out of the way to open up towards broader conversation. So if you, uh, with the understanding that the book is recently released in England and under the assumption not everyone's had a chance to glance at its table of contents, I'm just going to read as Tom earlier um, alluded uh, the chapter titles and then I'll read the last um, page of, of, the, of my contribution in the book. So, uh, with the introduction, your computer is on fire, and when did the fire start? We then move to the contributions. And I really want to frame here that the strength and the contributions of these authors are uh, the buoyant and uh, lasting um, material in this book. Nathan Engsbanger writes, the cloud is a factory. Sarah Roberts, your AI is a human. I write, a network is not a network. Kavita Philip, the internet will be decolonized. Mentali Thakur, Capture is pleasure. Mar Hicks, sexism is a feature, not a bug. Karina Shlom's gender is a corporate tool. Halcyon Lawrence, who's in the audience with the Siri disciplines. Uh, Sophia Noble, your robot isn't neutral. Andrea Stanton, broken is word. Noah uh, Wardrop Fruin, you can't make a games about much. Finally, part three, where will the fire spread? Janet Abate, Coding is not empowerment. Ben Allen, source code isn't. Srila Sakar, skills will not set you free. Paul Edwards, platforms are infrastructures on fire. And Thomas Bellini, typing is dead. And then two afterwards, from Kavita Philip, how to stop worrying about clean signals and start loving the noise. And then from which I'll read a moment now, my how do we live now in the aftermath of ourselves. So in the ongoing search for better heresies and causal explanations, let us pause with the historian of technology, Ksenia Tatarchenko, before ceding tomorrow's future to yesterday's science fiction. May tech observers stop offloading and outsourcing the imagination of better worlds without first attending to this one, the live blue earth, in the same spirit that Hegel noted that Minerva's owl takes flight in the dusk, so too does ethics, or social values only stretch its wings after algorithms have already been, in the military jargon, deployed. The robots will never take over. That has never been the crisis. Rather, robotic analysis of the future took over our minds and language many decades ago. As Lewis Mumford opened his 1934 masterpiece, Technics and Civilization, our species became mechanical before machines changed the world. Not only is tech human, people are the original machines. So the globe is ablaze, and few have the collective language to call to put it out. This book sounds out a call for that language. The challenge of anyone who lives in our broken world is not to delay to some future date the fact that the needs of the many outweigh the privileges of the few here and now. Pandemics may make no finer point. The difficulty of learning to love, live with, and care for others is perhaps the problem of all those who live. Those who overdraft from the accounts of the self live unknowingly on the credit of others. The resolution, if not solution, may come to all those who learn to live together now so as to pass on a better world, and soon enough from this world. Finally, all editors harbor conceits about their books. The four of us hope this book proves a no-crap book in at least two tenses. First, present-day readers 
acknowledge its message by acting on its seriousness and urgency. And second, as a consequence of the first, readers in the hopefully not too distant future will be able to look back and see its message as all too obvious. As I conclude this afterward, the internet is turning 50 years old to the day, surely a fitting moment to stage an intervention and declare its midlife crisis in full swing. The success of this book's no-nonsense attitude will be measured by its self-evident irrelevance 50 years from now, by how we learn to live in the aftermath of ourselves. Until then, the question remains, will its message, your computer is on fire, or the world as we know it, burn up first? Thanks. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite all the editors back on the screen, please, if at you, when you can. Um, and um, while we're um, opening this up for audience questions and um, involvement, um, I've got a few questions of my own. So, so this is, I'm really interested in the collaboration that you've put together here that's, that's really around a call to arms. So you, you all four of you are um, incredibly uh, accomplished, uh, known in your own right. You've, you've all published um, great um, and deep historical accounts of um, uh, serious problems around questions of technology and communication networking. What, um, what does issuing a call to arms look like in terms of how you decided? Like where's, you, you, each of you have talked a bit about the urgency. What, what was so different about this project for you? Um, maybe Kavita, maybe you wanna start. Thanks, Gina. Well, I started by saying what was different was the call to the global in Tom's original conference. But I do think if we look at the, the world events in the context of which this book actually took shape over the last year and a half, we've had the pandemic, we've had the fires in California, we've had COVID in India, we've had uh, internet rules and an increasing authoritarianism in, in India again. We've had uh, the recolonization of Africa through technology in many ways, not only by the West, but also uh, by non-Western forces, whether it's India or China or other multinationals seeking to invest. So we've had a whole shift in the way his, uh, we should understand the world. So as a historian interested in colonialism, my first book was on British colonialism in India. I was coming to uh, an understanding of, um, let's say, the 20th century Cold War technology and post-Cold War technological politics uh, in a world that literally was on fire. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking with various national, uh, uh, nation-based activist organizations, I could see the need at the ground level for a way of articulating solidarities, alliances, coalitions that respected the different histories on the ground, but found a way to engage with each other, not simply in the pieties and the political language that is acceptable, say, even at the UN, but in language that really challenge each other you know, challenge each other to take the technology seriously. I mean, that's one thing all four of us and every contributor in this book does, you know, really look at the tech, not just as a black box, but get into what made its features the choice as opposed to some other choice. What made this kind of tech inevitable? Were there other parts? Were there contingent ways to go? That's a kind of historical method that we all bring to this. But I think the real uh, motivating factor why this project and that not another was the collective spirit in the context of social justice uprisings, not only in the US, but all over the world. That's a, um, a good way to segue into been and a conversation that we want to bring in from our, our chat before the call. Um, ben, you're sitting in Tulsa at a particular moment in history. Do you want to want to talk a little bit about the stakes and what we're talking about in terms of both in terms of this book, but also in terms of this relationship to larger histories? 
Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, Gina. So uh, it's just, um, as it happens, I stand on the corner, um, I'm speaking to you from the corner of Harvard and 11th in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the United States, um, about four or five blocks from the historical Greenwood District, which um, actually beginning about one hour after our event today, we'll begin the symposia leading up to the centennial commemoration of the Tulsa Race Massacre, which is arguably the worst act of racial domestic terrorism um, in American history, uh, which happened again a century ago, yards from where I stand. Um, and uh, you know, I, I should say that you know, living in Oklahoma these last few years has been a political education that I'm, I was unprepared for, and but that this volume has helped me um, grow into. I, I should note that um, uh, the call for structural justice and for change feels so extraordinarily urgent, um, especially when you uh, experience it in the in the daily lives, which I, as a you know cisgendered white male, have been so clueless my entire life, and now I realize in ways previously invisible to me. Um, the kind of structural legacy of, of violence and racism and terror ledge, um, levered against uh, my neighbors, against um, the people I live with and, and work with day to day. Um, here's one example. So this is a, a recent revelation. Um, uh, I feel you know, precipitously uh, fortunate to work at the University of Tulsa and to be the Hazel Rogers professor. This is Hazel Rogers. Um, uh, she uh, is a teacher. Um, a community organizer, somebody that from the biographical material I can see, I'm happy to um, bear her name of. Um, uh, um, and she is, and don't miss this, the wife of John Rogers, who is a co-founder of, among many other so-called decent gentlemanly institutions in Tulsa, a co-founder of the KKK. And the KKK, just to note, grew in ranks after the Tulsa Race Massacre a century ago here in Tulsa. It grew. And that, you know, the, the killing of maybe 300 people, uh, Black people, and that literal aerial bombing of US citizens by other US citizens in my town um, is not just the beginning, but it's a, an, a, a resident event that continues to move on. My son, who now attends an integrated high school in North Tulsa, which is it's racially segregated, largely Black, um, he drives on a highway. Uh, US 64 that in the 60s under the guise of urban renewal was um, uh, ramrodded through the Greenwood district, a historically prosperous black district, again, 30 years after uh, after bulldozing and bombing the um, the the neighborhood into uh, the ground, um, so this is this is the legacy that that I inherit, um, and it's structurally complicated and it's urgent, um, and I take no credit except that I I seek to support the voices of those who can who can make better arguments, sharper, more compelling, more urgent arguments, and um, that was very evident to me in the the conferences hosted and, and um, that contributed to this. Um, you know, uh, you know, again, I want to note that Halcyon Lawrence, among others, has been just a, a, a tremendous uh, voice um, in, in, in this volume too. If we could talk about the contributors at length, that would take hours, but it's, it really has been a, a, a crowd meant for change. Mar and Tom, I want to give you both a chance to jump in, but I also want to, uh, you know, put out there that you know, I, I would love to hear a bit about the stakes, what's at stake, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the technology sector. So Tom, your story originally uh, of, of, of what happened at the first conference, I think is, a, is a, a chilling reminder of how certain conversations that we have in the social science and humanities really get shut off in um, really pivotal central moments of where choices that end up impacting all of us are made. Um, and so, you know, as you talk about kind of this, this, this process of, of shifting between the deep historical scholarship and the, and the agency and the action that you want to inspire in your readers, I'd, I'd love you to think about also, you know, what's, it, what's at stake in the tech sector? You know, is it, is it just that these are a group of people who, for whom that is their historical intervention, or is there something you think really 
particularly interesting or, or salient about looking at tech right now? Thank you, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, one thing that we've talked about many times as contributors and, and, and editors is that none of us are technophobes in the sense that we eschew uh, these technologies. I mean, right now, as I, I've got my MacBook, I've got my DLSR, I've got, you know, like we, we are in many ways as enamored of, uh, of, these, of these kinds of technologies, use them on a daily basis. It, they're unavoidable, even if one wanted to eschew them. Um, and so I, I say that because my sense is that a lo two longstanding ideas that have been held by colleagues in different parts of the university or different industries is either that, and I talk about this in my volume, either that we're sort of disingenuous because one second we're critiquing you know, Amazon and the next day and the next moment we're ordering something off of it or we're critiquing uh, Google and then we're using Google Maps. And um, the, first, the first sort of short circuiting of that is we are fully aware, absolutely fully aware of that tension, that contradiction that embraces us all, that there is no way to be very few ways to step completely outside of this and to stand in a condition of purity and level these kinds of critiques. No one I know is in that position. And that's not where critique can happen. We're, we are all, we all have this blood on our hands. Um, and that's the position from which these critiques uh, are leveled. The second one, and I think this is a legacy of decades past when there was a much harder division probably between, uh, let's say, you know, the, the STEM and humanities and social sciences, STEM on one side, humanities and social science on another, uh, is, is, an, is a prevailing idea that humanist critiques, social science critiques, art critiques of technology are speaking from a lack of understanding of the actual stuff, the, the, the hardware, the hard stuff. And I will tell you, based on high schoolers I know, and let alone undergrads all the way up, um, there are there is a massive uh, sort of community of people who know this stuff in and out. They could, they could have written these things if given the time and opportunity, and they have these kinds of deep engagements, savvy, critical thinking. There is absolutely... Every, the, the, the sort of bilingual community of humanistic and engineering, humanistic critique, engineering know-how through and through uh, is well established by now. So yes, maybe once upon a time, the vast majority of critiques of things related to technology came from those who, if you ask them, how does it work, may have drawn a blank. That is simply not true anymore. The people in this volume know this material through and through. And so I think the game has changed where we are ready at this moment in time, and we probably have been ready for about a decade, where this kind of critical scholarship as represented in this volume, but there are many other volumes out there we could point to, needs to be integrated at step one, day one of engineering education, of product design education, of all of these system education, what cannot happen anymore and which still to this day exists is that the ethics of AI is basically a senior, you know, got to get this off my, you know, my requirement list, graduation requirement that comes really late, or it's, it's sort of scoffed at or treated as this ancillary thing to the really hardcore, you know, what I really need to do to become a developer, to become, or to start my own firm. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an afterthought. And the, the fact of the matter is, is that you can't expect an undergraduate. I, we really think a lot about undergraduates. You can't expect an undergraduate to be fed three years and three quarters of a diet of it's a bug, not a feature, fix it in, fix it in the edits, bad actors. You can't feed them all of this techno utopian nonsense and then expect them just because they take one course in their final semester uh, on the ethics of AI or machine ethics or whatever it might be that suddenly they're like, oh gosh, I really should think about this stuff. Um, they're going to probably dismiss it. It needs to be integrated, and it can't just be one course. It has to be. It has to permeate all levels at all times, as students and as the rest of us are dealing with the hardcore of how these machines work and how to build them and how to build these systems. 
that and this critical thought has to be there, one in each eye at all times. We have to have a constant bifocal view of this problem, um, not just like bake the cake and then add some ethical icing to the top of it. It just doesn't work. Um, and I think we're ready for it because our students know this stuff. They know it way better than the people in the volume. They know it better than many of their instructors do in some cases. And they are also probably the generation most ready to think about structural problems since the 60s. They, they do not need an explanation about ideas of structural structuralism. They get it. It, was, it used to be really hard to explain to an undergrad what structural critique was. 10 years ago, uh, 50, I remember in grad school, it was really hard to walk someone through, you know, let's get past free will and just imagine a total empty sound chamber of agency. Now it's just like, yeah, we get, we get this. Let's go to the next stage of complexity. So let's bring those two things together. That's the urgency, at least from how I think about it. That's great. Mar, I want to give you a chance to jump in and talk about what you see is at stake here before we get to the questions from the audience. Well, one of the things that really worries me that's happening right now is that people are paying attention to these questions and these issues, but they're paying attention because now all of a sudden it's become unavoidable. Um, you know, seeing these problems is you, you can't not see them. And so what we've, I think, unfortunately noticed over the past year or two or three, and it's really accelerating, is that this whole... Um, discourse and idea of ethics and technology, and in particular AI ethics, is in some cases being taken over by people who have, um, I'm not going to say anything about their intentions, but their actions show that they have very little concern about actually fixing these problems or acting ethically. And instead they see jumping into this discourse as something that is now popular and that there is now funding attached to it. And there are many AI ethicists, of course, who are working in uh, tech uh, who do not fit into that category. But what we've simultaneously seen is that their critiques get consistently shoved aside. And in fact, they themselves often get shoved aside or fired. You know, I'm thinking of Dr. Timmy Gebru or, um, you know, her colleague, Dr. Margaret Mitchell. And there have been many other people disproportionately, uh, Black women who have worked in um, big tech corporations and have tried to do some of the things that, you know, these companies claim they're trying to do in terms of making things more equitable or making things more just. And in fact, what we see is that the people who are most successful at doing that end up um, not being applauded, in fact, end up being shown the door in many cases, or their jobs become um, impossible to do to the point where they just, they have to uh, do something else. They leave the field. And I think, you know, if we're talking about the stakes for tech, I would like to just make it a little bit, um, a little personal, a little self-reflective. I think we also have to talk about the stakes for our field as well. Now we come from sort of um, a a, an array of different fields. My field is history of computing. And um, I think that, you know, for a long time, my field did a really bad job of making sure, for instance, that it was global, that it was diverse, that it was platforming the voices of um, people who are not men. And so that's a struggle that's still going on. I'd like to mention that in addition to the two conferences that Tom put on, uh, there was a third conference in between those two. And that was actually where five of the contributors to the book came um, in. It was a, a conference called Command Lines held at the Computer History Museum in 2017. And that was where Sophia Noble, Halcyon Lawrence, Sarah Roberts, Mitali Thacker and Srila Sarkar came into the volume at that point. And that conference was, it was put on, I was one of the co-organizers, it was put on to try to address the fact that we were doing a really bad job as historians of computing in putting on conferences where, you know, um, all white panels were the norm. All male panels were often, um, you know, they, they were maybe not um, the norm, but they were well, I'd say there were a simple majority of panels to be sure. And so, you know, 
it's not just that we're <laughs> complaining and critiquing others. This is something that we're we're trying to, you know, it's a structural problem that uh, goes throughout a lot of the systems that we're all a part of, and that includes um, academia and higher education as a whole. And I think that if we look at the ways that tech is politicized and how we refuse to accept how political it is, we also start to see some of those same problems when we think about what's happening with um, the corporatization of higher education right now. Thank you for that. We have a media historian, sociologist, Thomas Streeter with us this evening, um, day for those of you in North America. And he asks, um, what do you think about the fact that doing something legally substantially to regulate, break up or constrain the power of big tech is suddenly popular, or at least a little bit in demand? Um, what do you make of that? I'll just add, Tom, I think it's, you know, two decades late um, and about time. Uh, one really important argument that I think is foregrounded in the book, um, uh, Sarah Roberts discusses how uh, what we call, so, uh, you know, what we continually call tech is, in fact, in many ways, would best fall under a communication or media regulatory framework that would avail itself to much more rigorous um, and legitimate critique, uh, and you know, it seems like there there's an opportunity for that. And the call here, maybe to speak to some of the other questions, is to organize, um, to use the language in ways that galvanize policymakers and political organizations to get action done, to get policy passed. I, I mean, Facebook is uh, has you know, two and a half times the number of people um, than in um, China, mainland China. And that's only if you count the, you know, active users, never mind the shadow profiles. This, it's just unconscionably large. There's no scale of human history in which that is an appropriately sized organization. We have another question from Carl Mendonca. Um, asking what are the mechanisms for accountability that can enforce more democratic, inclusive, and participatory forms of decision making on the part of tech companies. Uh, Carl continues with both political parties in the US clamoring for more tech regulation. Part of the question is not if public policy should play a role, but how should that process be managed and uh, you know, I would add to several of the pieces in the in the book talk about not necessarily on a working on a political realm, but uh, more in terms of um, corporate governance, uh, other kinds of participation in tech cultures. So maybe um, um, someone take on this idea. How could we what are the mechanisms for 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 more accountability? I, I'll pick up on where Mar uh, left off. I completely agree with Mar about um, focusing our attention on those who in fact did try to work in places like Google ethics commissions, like Timnit Gebru, and the ways in which they were first welcomed and then shown the door. Um, in order to focus on what happens perhaps outside academia and our wish lists, I began my chapter by citing um, an activist organization or an advocacy campaign called Whose Knowledge. And its founder, Anasuya Sengupta, has been involved for a long time in doing exactly this and engaging with technology companies, with um, Wikimedia Foundation, for example. Um, to, um, you know, to address the ways in which regulation might happen. And this is not a kind of legal lobbyist on the Hill pushing for specific things and lobbying, but this is an ongoing conversation of the kind we have perhaps in our graduate seminars and our undergraduate classrooms. So I wanna emphasize that this notion of a classroom in which the radicalness of what we can teach is very much shaped by how our students are coming to this. So that was Tom's example of undergrads already coming to us with a sense of structural racism, or as in Zachary Loeb's recent review of this book in Boundary 2, um, the title uh, of it was Burn It All, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're actually encountering a world in which uh, we can't move fast enough for the majority of the world's people. 
Um, and I think that the slow pace of regulation, lobbying, uh, reg uh, um, kind of a discussion among stakeholders, which usually means did Elon Musk go and meet Trump? You know, did, uh, did Jack Dorsey talk with the Hindu right before he donated 2.5 million to their social wing? You know, that's not the kind of discussion we're talking about. We're talking about bringing stakeholders to the table who haven't historically had power. And so for that, I turn to, to activist organizations, campaigns, advocacy groups that have shown us the way. That's great. Um, in continuing on that theme, we have two questions and I'd like to ask them as a, as a combined question. So friend um, Siska Hafner asks, um, what advice would you have for undergraduate computer science students? What resources or, or what, 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 what can they do and then Richard Gall asks, well, how do we reach cynics? So I think you've got a couple of audiences and you've got questions from the audience asking you, how can we, how can we engage more? How can you engage more around these ideas? I'll, I'll jump in briefly. Um, I think that one thing for that under, for Francisca and other students who feel this way, uh, one thing we're really emphatic about is keep going. Like we want you to get a CS degree. Uh, we want you to pursue these kinds of, of passions. And we, we want you to think about the kinds of issues that we and others are talking about and then, and then, um, and bring them with you. We do not want to dissuade anyone who has these kinds of passions from going into some other field as a sort of an avoidance technique, because that doesn't solve anything. Uh, it, it, and in terms of reaching um, cynics, I think there's something there's something uh, that we have in our in our in our in our repertoire, which is really powerful, which comes back to the point of we know the stuff. Like I've had people kind of come at me when I uh, when you know when I talk about the sort of structural by the, the, the structural biases or anglophone English language biases of just you name it, technology from the last two centuries. They come at me, trying to footnote me to death, um, you know, to suggest that they know the stuff better than I do. And I know it better than them. And many of them, not all, some will not seed. And you know, you cannot, that's not a cynic, that's a bigot. You can't win in that, in that discussion. And, and, um, but cynics, I have no, I have no personal beef with, um, because there are many who I'll engage in those kinds of conversations with, who at some point will say, I did not know this, you know. I did. I, I had never thought about this before, and in fact, many of many of the the people who first taught me of these deeply embedded issues were, were some who had never really critically thought about it before. But they were the ones who who brought it to my attention. I remember. I will never forget a conversation with someone who co-developed Unicode, saying to me, "Tom, you have no idea how deep." in like system architecture is the left to right bias of computing. Because I was talking to him about Chinese and Chinese is a right to left or historically a right to left language, Arabic, Hebrew. We we're just kind of talking about various biases. And he said, Tom, you have no idea how deep in the architecture that goes. Therefore, how deep you have to dig and rewire in order to try to address that. And I said, tell me more, tell me more. And all of that stuff comes into the repertoire in these conversations with sort of well-meaning, but not like on this particular subject, uneducated cynics. And some of them will listen to this kind of empirical work. Many won't, and I, I class them in a different category. I consider them to be bigots, um, people whose minds are just essentially connected to some viewpoint and they will not budge, uh, but that's a different story. So this is to say, knowing your stuff and engaging seriously and saying, okay, let's talk about the empirics of this, this thing that you think you know so well. Um, in my experience, that can soften the concrete a little bit, not always, but it can soften it a little bit. And then there's a, a, a readiness to talk about these other issues of, okay, now that you see this, what do you think of the fact that a quarter of humanity or a fifth of humanity is excluded from these technologies? Right. Do you like that? And they're like, no, I don't like that. You're, right. Let's talk. Um, exactly. That's my experience. Well, speaking of let's talk, um, we have a question from Ashwin Matthew. Um, and 
and he asks us about, um, you know, what kinds of potential for solidarity do you see through the work in this volume? What, what potentials for solidarity do you see? I would love to hear what my co-editors think, but let me just offer a couple. Um, and this kind of riffs and ties back into an earlier thread. Um, um, I'm struck by sort of within the academy, the kind of interdisciplinary solidarity of just fields and intellectual delta that is tech critique. Um, you know, there's many, many necessary um, voices at the table. Um, this book is a sample of a, what is and should be a much larger conversation. I think that's really crucial. Um, the previous discussion about how do we sort of get outside the ethics as a single course um, tagged on at the end of a otherwise technologically blind um, um, curriculum um, is one that I think invites uh, the wholesale full court press of any student in at any situation. Like if, if ethics doesn't resonate with your instructors, bring and push them on questions of whatever the vocabulary is that gets them to respond. Is it values and character and they're kind of individually user design focused or would they respond to justice and inequality and, you know, questions of, you know, you know, um, you know, like a, um, many colors of emojis are not going to solve the structural inequalities that exclude billions of people. Um, or the Halcyon Lawrence's work, you know, the the accent bias of Siri. Um, uh, and so I think I think there's just an opportunity if this is a kind of solidarity to scale out the conversation here into broader uh, views, more disciplines, more people at the table. Um, every step of a computer science education is eligible for this type of conversation. Um, and I'm sure there are others that I should be thinking about too. We have just a really short amount of time left together. And um, I see a question to just come in, but I wanna ask, um, because I'm really interested, how does working together on this volume change your own work? And you have about 30 to 45 seconds for that. So how are you changed as a scholar by working together in this way? Maybe Mar, do you want to kick off on that one? I'll put you on the spot. Well, I think one way that it's helped change my work is that it's um, it's just made it more possible for me to be able to say a lot of the things in print that I say normally in the classroom and that I teach normally in the classroom by, um, you know, constructing syllabi that have articles and book chapters taken from different places. So being in conversation with all of the um, chapter authors in this book, and then also in conversation with the editors of the volume, let me, you know, kind of stand on the shoulders of giants and um, just take things further and in the direction that I wanted to take them um, in a way that, you know, I wouldn't have probably at this point in my career ever written a book like this that was, you know, I wouldn't have solely authored a book that was all about this topic. So it was a really nice way to be able to kind of do more of what I felt was really urgent to do in a scholarly way um, outside of the classroom and make this into something that people who, you know, are, are never going to take a class in STS or tech ethics because maybe they are out of college or they didn't go to college or whatever, but they still want to engage in these conversations because these are such important issues. They can now have, um, you know, this book if they want to. And of course, we're not the only ones doing this. There's lots and lots and lots of um, other folks and other scholars who are doing amazing work on this, you can find them all in the footnotes of any of these chapters. Um, but I think one thing that was nice for me was to be able to do something that was, um, you know, very forthright, kind of written almost colloquial colloquially um, bite size or it can be bite size. You don't have to read it all at once. And I just want to say one thing to the person who asked the question about, well, what can students do if they're undergrads who are concerned about these issues? And what I would say, and this is sort of a something that I, I try to gently bring into my, um, my classroom, is the idea that somehow tech 
can fix the world, that it's the lever to move the universe. That's kind of the sort of thing that got us into this problem, right? This idea of technological determinism. So reject that. Your um, CS professors, they might um, unconsciously give you that idea that if you want to do good, use the tools of the CS um, discipline to, to do that. And that can be enormously destructive. So kind of get outside of your major field. I think we all have to do that and look at things from other perspectives, but also use the tools and expertise of other fields. And I don't mean by becoming an expert yourself in those fields, but by leveraging people who are experts in those fields and really bringing them on board. And um, if you're in a position where you're, you know, out in the workforce and you're thinking about these issues, um, the term solidarity came up, but we didn't really talk about it in terms of labor solidarity and labor organization. Um, whistleblowers have been really important during the tech clash, but so has labor solidarity and so have um, attempts to organize a group of white collar professionals who up until now felt like they had no need whatsoever for labor unions or organization or labor solidarity. So those are some of the things that give me hope when I think about where we're headed and maybe where we hope we can go. There are ways to fix this problem. And if you read this book, for instance, you'll see how there are clear patterns in um, you know, corporate power or corporate um, corporations run amok and different sectors getting too much power in the economy, and then how those get dismantled. And this is just what we're seeing again with big tech. And so it's not an unfixable problem. It's not an unwinnable battle. And so that's what I would say, just so people don't lose hope. Thank you. And I would like to say thank you all to um, first, the editors of Your Computer is on Fire for joining us today um, for what's been a really fascinating conversation um, and for writing a really important book. I um, am grateful for all of you for joining us um, and, and really want to urge you to um, pick up the book, um, dive in deeper to the issues and, um, and uh, the follow-up email that will come from the event will have some of the references to things that we've discussed. I'll turn it back over to our fabulous events team who will take us out from there. Thank you so much, Gina. And thank you to all of our speakers today for their candid and, and important insights on this topic. We really appreciate you all giving your time and discussing with us. So thank you. Um, and thank you also to the audience for attending and their brilliant questions. And as Gina said, you will receive a follow up email in due course. Um, and on to now our next event, which will be on Wednesday, 2nd of June, with Professor Lily Arani of UC San Diego in con conversation with Professor Philip Howard. And you can visit the events page on our OII website to sign out, sign up for that. Thank you again and have a wonderful day, everyone.